your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition with Jeanette Roche. Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. Thanks so much for joining us for a look at what made headlines in Alberta this past week. The Insurance Bureau of Canada says Calgary was battered last month with the second costliest event in Canadian history. As a severe hailstorm brought about a spike in claims, the Bureau says the initial damage estimates nearly $2.8 billion in insured losses. Hailstones as big as golf balls pummeled cars and homes and the tarmac at Calgary International Airport, which damaged planes at WestJet and Flair Airlines. The hail was strong enough to force those airlines to ground 10% of their fleets to repair, uh, for repairs rather, and inspections. Officials with the Alberta Wildfire says nearly seven weeks after a wildfire forced the evacuation of Jasper National Park, the blaze is now officially under control. They say the change in status means the fire has been suppressed to ensure it won't spread outside of its defined perimeter. That area is around 278 kilometers long. A wildfire in the region burned nearly a third of the town site's structures. Incident Commander Landon Shepard says there's still a good chance some of that smoke, along with some flames, will be visible inside the fire area right into early winter. Around 5,000 residents from Jasper and 20,000 visitors to Jasper National Park were ordered out in late July due to the wildfire. Meantime, Jasper's town council heard it wouldn't be possible to secure enough temporary housing for the people who lost their homes to that wildfire. The municipality estimates roughly 2,000 of the town's 5,000 residents now have nowhere to live as more than 800 housing units were destroyed in the fire. A local councillor says she worries many displaced people are falling through the cracks. The Jasper Fire is considered the second most expensive wildfire in Alberta's history behind the 2016 Fort McMurray Fire. Alberta RCMP say three people are dead at a home in Lloydminster on the Saskatchewan side of the city's border. Police are investigating the incident as a triple homicide and a targeted attack. The bodies were discovered following a wellness check by police. The suspect is still at large. Police issued a brief statement assuring residents there's no current threat to the public. According to locals, RCMP gathered at the home on Wednesday evening, taped it off and were there through Friday. No word yet on the identities of those who died. Autopsies will be conducted over the next several days. Well, this week we commemorated the 23rd anniversary since the world changed forever following the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. The world lost so many people that day, but there were also many heroes celebrated. This year, a special event was held in Lethbridge to celebrate our own fallen firefighters. BCN's Heidi Echeverria was there to capture it all. Never to be forgotten, because nothing can replace the presence of the heroes who one day fell to save the life of others. It is good to honor and commemorate what they used to be in life and their acts of heroism. For that, a fallen firefighter memorial parade and ceremony was held in leverage to remember those who made the last sacrifice. Troy Hicks. Chief Fire Marshal explains what this ceremony represents for them. 23 years ago, the world changed forever on September 11th, 2001, um, when those two planes ran into the towers, uh, collided with the tower there in New York City. Um, at the end of that day, uh, we had um, 343 firefighters, 71 police officers, 84 Port Authority, and close to 3,000 civilians perished on that day. Firefighters don't just die from burns or while they are trying to save the life of others. Heart attack, trauma, falls and explosions are some of the reasons. The leading cause of death uh, for firefighters in North America is cancer. Um, and we've been working on that a lot. Um, the second cause of death is cardiac arrest. Um, and then just to go the last one, the, the, the number one cause of uh, traumatic 
Firefighter deaths or traffic collisions. The commemoration ended with a solemn ceremony in which the names of the brave men of North America who are no longer with us in this world were mentioned. It's a very important uh, ceremony that we hold each year. Um, it is a solemn occasion, but it's also one that we remember and honor all of the fallen firefighters throughout North America. For Bridge City News, I'm Heidi Echavarria. Up next, a three-month-old trial ends in the shocking sentencing of two Southern Alberta men. That's next. Anthony Olenek and Chris Carbert, commonly known as the Coots 2, were sentenced to six and a half years on Monday. The two men were found guilty on charges of unlawful possession of firearms and mischief for their roles in the blockade at the Coots border back in 2022. BCN's Landon Hickok followed the trial and filed this report. It's been three months since the trial began for Chris Carpert and Anthony Olenek and sentencing was just heard for the two men who were initially charged of conspiring to murder police officers but were since acquitted. However, they were charged and found guilty of possession of firearms for dangerous purpose to the public peace as well as mischief and Olenek separately and unlawful possession of explosives. Justice David LeBrens gave his sentencing for the two men. They've each been handed six and a half years sentences. For Olenek, it was six years on the firearms charge, six months concurrent on the mischief charge, and six months consecutive on the unlawful ex possession of an explosive charge. For Carbert, almost the same thing, except he's been given six and a half years on the firearms charge and six months concurrent on the mischief charge. Each man have been serving time in remand since their arrest in a total of 1,409 days. That is time and a half, and in which ice closer to four years in time served. They are looking at 963 days remaining. The justice accepted that the two men saw the blockade as a last-ditch stand against governmental restrictions, and that the weapons Carver brought, he declined that they were for hunting use, and that they were sorely for engaging with police. Olenek's defense lawyer Marilyn Burns has stated that she will appeal the sentencing and the charges that are left on the two men, stating that this trial has been political since the start. The sentence is excessive with strong political features and it will be appealed. Justice LeBrens commented extensively regarding the political nature of the protest, about the men choosing to come to the protest despite having other avenues using democratic reform. He decided on his own and he considered the danger to the police to be high. I would disagree with that, but that's his decision and I have developed respect for Justice Lorenz, although in many respects I disagree with him. So we will see what appeals come by either the defense or the Crown, but for now it is six and a half years for both Anthony Olenek and Chris Carbert for their roles at the Coots border blockade. Meanwhile, many supporters of Carbert and Olenek flooded the courthouse to bear witness to the two men's sentencing, and many were left disappointed as a result. One supporter and former Fort McLeod town councillor, Marco Van Hugenboss, shared his opinions, as he is also faced with charges of mischief at the blockade. Six and a half years when we have violent criminals on parole, violent reoffenders in the public and we have men here who were involved in a political protest. It was a political protest during unprecedented times and none of that unfortunately has made its way into the court and I feel that this is a travesty of our justice system and I feel that what happened here today is sets a very very dangerous precedence for proceedings in Canada moving forward. The Emergencies Act was called into effect based on the Coots issue that happened at, at Coots. Now, if that all of a sudden was to go away or a very light sentence on that, then automatically that, that the Liberal government enacting of that Emergency Act doesn't look so good. It's already been deemed unconstitutional, and if there was nothing here to hold any evidence or any grounds to it, then it also becomes illegal. So I believe there's a lot of political pressure still involved even in the decisions today. 
The province of Alberta is making a move to ban cameras at all intersections as well as on provincial roads and connecting roads. Alberta's transportation minister is proposing to only permit the use of speed cameras in playground, school and construction zones. Lethbridge Police Chief Shaheen Medizadeh explains what the response is to the proposed changes within the automated traffic enforcement program. The key point here is, first of all, these devices have proven to be uh, successful in their deployment and over the years uh, they have uh, proven to be uh, reducing the speeds at the locations that they've been deployed in and also the number of uh, traffic infractions that they're supposed to catch, mostly red light cameras and speeding. Uh, and that's supported by also reduction in the revenues over the last five years, which is, amounts to about 41% reduction in revenues. Simple fact is you don't speed, you don't go through red light, you won't get a ticket. Coming up after the break, we're seeing combines in the fields these days, but how much did a dry July affect our crops? Find out after this quick break. Well, we definitely were a bit concerned at the springtime this year. Uh, we had some strained years over the past three years, but we definitely saw rainfalls in the spring. Well, many would agree that our agriculture sector is the bread and butter of our economy. We rely so much on our farmers and producers, but how is the industry doing? How healthy is it and where are we headed? We spoke with Alberta's Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation, RJ Sigurdsson, to find out. Well, we definitely were a bit concerned at the springtime this year. Uh, we had some strained years over the past three years, but we definitely saw rainfalls in the spring. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't see some of the rain uh, in July that would have been necessary to really uh, push our agricultural industry to a what I would call a bumper year. But uh, we're seeing average across the province right now. We're still waiting on a lot of the reports to come in. Uh, but definitely that, that spring rain that we saw this year definitely replenished the soil after three years of drought conditions. So it, it improved uh, dramatically uh, this year. So in your opinion, what crops kind of suffered a bit this season? Well, we definitely, uh, due to the fact that we didn't get some of the uh, midterm rains in July, uh, we definitely are seeing uh, some of the strain in our wheat, uh, definitely some strain in the barley. Uh, it just didn't get uh, that rain in the mid-year that we, you would like to generally see that it's going to improve the conditions. Now, China has been discussing putting tariffs on Canadian canola in retaliation to the federal government putting a 100% tariff on Chinese-made EVs. So, RJ, how much would this really hurt our producers? I mean, I read close that the close to, what, 70% of our canola exports go to China? Yeah, 70% of our uh, canola exports do go to China. So definitely this is a major concern for our farmers. Uh, it will have an impact uh, on the agricultural industry as a whole here in the province and west all of Canada. And uh, we're working closely with our federal counterparts to come to a quick resolution to this. Uh, this is very untimely. When you uh, say that the combines are in the field right now, uh, the, this couldn't have come at a worse time. So we definitely are working with our federal government right now to find a quick resolution to this and uh, support our farmers and ranchers uh, during this time. So if the spat with China continues long term, RJ, are there other trading partners we can reach out to maybe in Asia or elsewhere? Well, this has been a focus of uh, our provincial government is to take a look at the opportunities of diversifying our global trade markets. And that's why one of my first trips uh, was over to Asia to have conversations about additional pathways and strengthening, strengthening the uh, food security for those countries that have been uh, solid trading partners with Alberta and also looking at opportunities all across the globe, which is going to continue to strengthen agriculture here in the province. You know, it's certainly been an interesting year with drought concerns, as you mentioned earlier, and low reservoir levels, especially here in southern Alberta. But thankfully, as we talked about as well, we did receive a little bit of rainfall. Now, I know the province has been looking at ways to shore up the four pillars, share, store, conserve, and manage water. Is there anything definite in the works right now? 
Well, we definitely are having that conversation, understanding that uh, water is a finite resource and we have to treat it as such. So we are looking at uh, different ways to manage our water here in the province of Alberta, ensure that we are maximizing uh, on efficiency as much as possible. Uh, we're also looking at uh, investments across the board, including investing in our irrigation systems. Uh, we have uh, 933 million uh, that we put forward to our irrigation infrastructure modernization. Um, through that, uh, we're seeing efficiencies that is opening up new acres to irrigation. Uh, we're looking at investing in uh, feasibility studies, $5 million in the 2024 budget to take a look at additional storage options like uh, the Airmore Dam and Ardley Dam. And right down to the fact that we're working with Acadia in the special areas right now, uh, they've partnered with CIB and um, they are looking right now at a whole new irrigation district in East Central Alberta that would open up 1.8 million acres of irrigation, which is important as we continue uh, to look at the fact that the global demand for food is gonna continue to rise over the uh, decades to come. So how about some of that water sharing? How vital is that for our producers? Well, definitely um, it's incredibly important. And uh, when we look at the long-term vision here in the province about investing in air, um, you know, infrastructure to be able to increase storage and capacity, uh, that's really important in Southern Alberta. And that's why we're looking at all options available to be able to increase storage so that we can provide that stability um, when we're looking at a growing province that is seeing groves of people move here. And we're seeing um, some of the most uh, positive growth in the agricultural space. Coming up after the break, it's election time south of the border and soon the Canadian Conservatives could call for one in Canada. So what better time to think about what we should be considering when combating election fraud? That's next. Keep it right here. The U.S. presidential election is just under two months away, and here in Canada we could see a federal election since we currently have a minority government. But we're increasingly hearing concerns about election integrity and potential election fraud. Up next, I'm joined by Fred Bradley, who served as a parliamentary development advisor in Europe, which included advising on election integrity. He shares with me how during those times, he observed many attempts at election fraud. Take a look. Well, my, my actual experience was, most, was in Ukraine in terms of election monitoring. And I monitored elections in the in 1998 parliamentary elections. Uh, the 2004 presidential election and the 2012 parliamentary election. And over the period of time I saw in, in my initial experience in 1998, there was certainly um, a lot of manipulation and fraud at the polling stations. Uh, but the, what I witnessed in 2004 during the presidential election was certainly uh, uh, very eye-opening because I monitored three the three rounds of the presidential election in in two thousand or in in uh, two thousand and four, and saw many different types of election fraud during that and manipulation of the vote. When we got to the two thousand and twelve parliamentary election, it was basically a, what we would call a fundamentally free and fair election. The processes, uh, the, the results of the voting were accurate. But two thousand and four was really the ultimate. Um, uh, experience in in uh, monitoring uh, pervasive election fraud uh, conducted by um, the, the the administration uh, of the uh, the political party and and the administration the administration uh, presidential administration in Ukraine or or their cohorts and Russian interference was obviously a hallmark of that I could go into some detail on that if you wanted me to. But there were things like uh, carousel voting where buses would roll up and they, people would come out and go into polling stations and vote and then go on to another polling station because they, their names were on multiple lists in multiple different polling stations. And they just, wow. that's how one way of influencing the vote. The other was uh, disappearing ink where if they knew a polling station was uh, going to vote for an opposition candidate they would have this disappearing ink pen and when the ballots went to count there'd be no the ballots 
would you know would not show the the mark for the uh, opposition candidate. Interesting. So corrupt. <laughs> now here in Canada and the U.S., there's been a lot of attention on foreign interference attempts from nations like China and Russia and Iran, among others. So what methods are hostile nations using to try to sway election results over here? The game has changed incredibly. Uh, social media is a big part of it. Manipulating social media, um, fake news and propaganda, um, deep fakes and manipulated media. I mean, they hacking into political parties' campaigns. Uh, this has happened in the United States both currently in terms of Democratic and Republican attacks. Um, they can target voting infrastructure. There's just, you know, there's diplomatic and economic pressures that have been used. They can targeting uh, uh, influence operations, uh, manipulation of traditional media sources with putting in wrong data out there, which is then reported, et cetera. So there's, there's many different ways of in which inter foreign actors can interfere in our elections um and then there's there's actually and then they have their espionage and covert operations and they will also exploit any any loopholes they see in our electoral processes if they can do that so there are many different ways in which that foreign interference and manipulation can take place and both russia and china have been been acted big actors in that in the united states uh Russia, more in the United States, China here in Canada. What changes do you think the federal government could put in place to make it a lot more difficult for other nations to interfere? Well, we currently have a Royal Commission that's looking into that and we're going to provide some uh, some advice on that. Um, obviously, um, whether it's direct foreign influence by embassies or staff of embassies, I think actions need to be taken. I think the idea of having a foreign registry, I think other countries have it, Great Britain, the United States, Australia, um, to ensure that th these activities, these agents have to register. And and and, and maybe and, and our security services uh, need to be um, perhaps given more resources to uh, to protect our electoral systems against this. From federal elections to a provincial by-election, we chat with each candidate vying for a spot as Lethbridge West's newest MLA. We'll be right back. Former two-time Lethbridge City Councilor Rob Miyashiro has been chosen by members of the Alberta NDP to represent the party in the upcoming by-election in the Lethbridge West riding. Miyashiro beat out two-time former Lethbridge City Councilor Bridget Mearns. Miyashiro previously ran in the Lethbridge East riding in the last provincial election but lost to the UCP's Nathan Newdorf. Miyashiro says his previous attempt to win a seat in the Alberta's legislature taught him some valuable lessons. I learned that talking to people in the doors is really important, making sure they understand um, where our party stands on different issues and where I stand on different issues. It's really important that, that we get out there and people get to know um, uh, who I am as a, as a candidate and understand more about our leader. Um, those are the things um, that that you learn is that hard, there's nothing replaces hard work and nothing replaces getting out there and talking to the people in the constituency and, and listening to what they have to say. The United Conservative Party, meanwhile, is set to pick its nominee on September the 23rd for that same riding. No date has been called yet for the Lethbridge West by-election, but Premier Smith must announce one by January 1st of next year. The three are City Councilor John Middleton Hope, Realtor Shauna Groninger, and Aaron LeClaire. LeClaire is the former constituency office manager for both MLA Nathan Newdorf and MP Rachel Thomas. We asked LeClaire, a married mother, for why she feels she's the best candidate. Because I've been already in, in the city, I'm keenly aware of the needs that Lethbridge has. I've already been advocating uh, and liaisoning between the city and um, the government and the minister's offices through my, my position as a constituency manager. So I feel that I can, I can do the best job and I can also just hit the ground running. 
One of the other candidates, city councilor and former police chief John Middleton Hope, spoke with BCN to share his ambitions and plans as the candidate for Lethbridge West and MLA if he is elected. He says his core values and priorities include safety and security, education, health care, and infrastructure. There are a number of things that are that are going on in the city that we really need to pay attention to. What you're going to hear is you're going to hear solutions, both at the municipal level and at the provincial level. And that's where I have the experience. That's where I have developed uh, decades of expertise. And at the end of the day, I have the energy and I am electable because of my experience, because people know me in the city and they know me as a person of action. Shauna Grunninger is also seeking to become the candidate for the UCP in Lethbridge West. She is a real estate agent, businesswoman, wife, and mother. Grunninger says she and the party are a good fit. Very community focused. I spend a ton of time and I've given a ton of time to, you know, different organizations in Lethbridge. Um, I, I've always helped to do my best in creating you know, are, are a great human and, and the next generation that's coming to, you know, continue who we are and what we do as, as, as Lethbridge and, and obviously a province. We also wanted to hear from the president of the UCP's Lethbridge West riding, Davey Wiggers. He joined Hal Roberts to give us his thoughts on what could be a very important by-election for Alberta's United Conservatives. Take a look. So when is the nomination vote when we will officially find out who will become the nominee for the UCP for the Lethbridge West riding? Uh, coming up really quickly, uh, just a little over a week away on the 23rd. And the vote itself will again be held in the theatre gallery at the Lethbridge Public Library. Davey, this is a riding that was held by the NDP Shannon Phillips for quite a number of years. What will it take to make a Tory blue? Uh, we have volunteers coming from each one of those constituency associations uh, to come knock on the doors, get out the vote, and uh, ensure that the positive message of the UCP, the forward thinking and forward action uh, that has been put through by our government uh, translates into Lethbridge West. So Lethbridge can uh, present a united front to government and, uh, you know, really bring uh, the interests of Lethbridge and Lethbridge West particularly uh, to the forefront. Premier Daniel Smith has until January the 1st, I believe, to call a by-election, and your nominee will be chosen by the 23rd. Any chance that Smith may call the by-election a little earlier, before Thanksgiving, maybe? Um, if I were a betting man, I'd probably uh, say that it would be uh, uh, maybe prior to American Thanksgiving, but uh, I, I don't think we're going to see uh, um, uh, prior to Canadian Thanksgiving, I don't think. Davey Wiegers is the UCP Lethbridge West riding president. Thanks so much for your time today. Well, most of us are still in summer mode, but some are already dreaming of hitting the slopes. Next, how the Canadian Ski Patrol is gearing up for winter.